two weeks ago, we had a we had a very moving and very memorable afternoon with Norm, and so we're super excited to be able to um, to have that opportunity again today. And so I wish to acknowledge that our office is on the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nation. Um, and I'm coming to you from my home office today, which is on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Kwantlen First Nation. I'd like to thank IRCC, uh, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada for funding the event today and welcome. I can see Sean, our uh, settlement officer is on today. And if anybody else is there, hello IRCC. So our time together today, I am very much looking forward to moving into the next part of the day, which is um, our smudge and prayer and guided meditation with Norm. Um, and Norm's going to talk to us about um, Indigenous worldview, current events and conflicts around land, law, gender, and how many ways do humans divide each other. We're going to ask some questions or talk about difficult questions to ask ourselves and each other, and then we'll finish with uh, another closing meditation. Um, so for those of you who uh, didn't get to meet Norm last week, there's Norm. Um, and we're really excited. I'm not going to read the bio again because I want to just jump in and, and let, Norm, let Norm talk and, and share with us. Thank you, Katie and McGeen. Ah, so nice to be invited into all of your living rooms. I can see all your living rooms. This is such an invasion of privacy <laughs> that Zoom gives us. And this this strange new experience of having all these faces right here, you know, on the screen. It's um, so different. But welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you for the land acknowledgement, Katie. I'm going to do another one. Um, I don't know if you can know this, but I, I lit the smudge here. And so I'll, I'll waft some sage smoke over your way uh, to cleanse and um, have the virtual smell. It smells wonderful. Although it is kind of really getting in my face here, right, right in front of me. So I'm just going to set that aside for a little bit. And that will help me stay grounded uh, to share in a good way. Um, and I acknowledge the land a little bit differently uh, since I've started learning some new ways, some land-based uh, approaches, uh, indigenous land-based. So I acknowledge the land first, the land that has been there since the beginning, the land itself, uh, really our first ancestor. I call her our, our greatest, our, our first, our great, great, greatest grandmother. Um, it's the, the ancestor we share with the dinosaurs. Uh, so really our first ancestor who has given us everything, every cell in our bodies, everything we've ever eaten or drank uh, or taken in has come from the land. And so Indigenous people know that and we treat her as an ancestor, not as property. And we'll talk more about some of those Indigenous uh, ways of viewing the world and the universe soon. And then I also acknowledge the people who've taken care of the land most recently. Uh, for, the, for the past 15, 20,000 years, the, the Musqueam and the Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh people have taken care of these lands here, uh, where I am in Vancouver. And they've done such a good job as of all the indigenous people around the world. Most of them took such good care of the land that when any new people arrived, they were not only as good as new, they were better than new because those people, indigenous people, took care of the land and improved it as much as they could throughout their lives because that was their responsibility and they understood that. And they never saw it as property, but they saw it as a, as a, as a rel relative, as a relation. So I'll also, like the smudge, and I'll say a little bit of a prayer and, and they hopefully, in the way I say the prayer might give you a little insight into an indigenous understanding of our relationship with the universe as well, with the creator. So I'll begin by saying, Oho, great spirit, spirit of all things, 
spirit of the sun and the stars and the moon and the earth, spirit of everything, everywhere, every when. We are grateful. We are grateful for this opportunity to be humans here, now, in this place, on this planet, to have the opportunity to use the many gifts you've shared with us, our intellect, our mobility, our dexterity, our consciousness, to use our best good judgment in a good way to, to be good human beings and to fulfill the sacred responsibilities that we have to use and manage and protect and defend our territories in a good way uh, as best we can working together and to maintain the balance as has been taught to us by, by our first grandmother, the, the land. So I give thanks and, and ask that you stay with us, Great Spirit, in, the, in this circle and help us use our best good judgment to work together and, and share understanding in the best way that we can so that we can continue to do good work and continue to be good human beings. All my relations. In my language, we would say, and most Indigenous people have a way of saying that after a prayer, all my relations. And that speaks to the relationships that we have with everything, everywhere, every when. Um, that's because the Great Spirit is the spirit of all things. And because the Great Spirit is, and all things have spirit, not just living things, but the land itself has spirit. And in that way, we're related. And we're not separated in any way, other than, I guess, this physical way that it's become difficult for us to, to connect in a spiritual way. Um, and I think some of that is because of the, the habits we've adopted through colonization. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. And so I hope that that prayer uh, made a little bit of sense to you. And it's nice to see some friendly faces. I see uh, Shirley, and I see Eleanor, uh, I see Ira, and Maisa. <laughs> um, and probably some others I, that won't fit on the screen. But uh, let's do a guided meditation. Um, so last time, before we do that, last time I, I told you a little bit about myself and a little bit about my history and a little bit about the history of Indigenous people in Canada. And I also included a couple of guided meditations. I think we started with uh, a tree. I think we started with a tree and then we ended with a, with water. So today I'll probably, I'll, I think I'll do two of land today, but we'll do a simple one of land in the beginning. So I'll ask you to be comfortable. Find a place where you can sit and listen. And maybe close your eyes if you wish. I'll ask you to notice, notice your body. <coughs> notice your feet. Notice your hands. Notice how your breath is in there today, now. Notice in. Let your mind slow for a minute. And let your mind open to a place of land. A place of land that you know. Anywhere. Let your body be there, that place of land. Let it be a good place.
place of comfort, a place of safety. Let this land know you. Let your body remember this place of land. Let your body notice how it is there. The weather, the season, Notice what is sharing this land with you. Are there creatures, plants, water, people? Smell. Sounds. Okay, I'm going to try and turn up my volume. <laughs> Notice what this land knows about you. Notice how you feel about this land. This land feels back for you the same way you feel for it. This land is an ancestor of yours, a relative. Feel that connection, that relationship. Let that feeling surround you, hold you, infuse you. Your body knows this land intimately. It always has. It always will. Remember this feeling. Your body knows this feeling. That's a feeling of love. That's how we're supposed to feel. Give thanks to this land. Say thank you. Let this land return to where it has been always. Prepare to come back to your body, to your room. Notice your breath. Notice your feet. Notice your hands. Notice your face and your breath. Open your eyes. You join us in the room. Okay. So to me, if I'm talking about what it means to be indigenous and the indigenous worldview and the differences between a colonized worldview and that, this exercise is an illustration of that. Uh, an understanding of how Indigenous people feel about the land. And it's, it's in here, it's in here, and it's that sense that 
most of us have been taught we don't have. Most of us have been taught we have five senses. And I think you would all agree, and let me know if you disagree, that we all have more than five senses. And that whoever taught us we only have five senses is putting us, putting you in a box, saying all that other stuff you feel or believe or sense isn't real. And it's not true. And so indigenous people have always known that, that there is a, and there's this huge sense that we have, which is that interconnected place that connects us to everything, everywhere, every when. And, and it never, and maybe we can be convinced, especially when, when you start really young, teaching them that not to believe it, not to accept it and to deny it, eventually we will stop hearing it, stop using it. And then those muscles will become weak. But we're learning to reawaken and to hear them again and to listen to those senses. And the more I talk to other people, the more I realize that everyone has them, not just, well, really, you know, people used to come in to the office and they say, well, can you help me? I, but I'm not indigenous. And we would say, well, we don't check ID and we can't test your blood. And really everybody's indigenous to somewhere. And so you all are indigenous to earth. And you all have a connection to land. If you go back far enough in your family line, there is a place of land where you have ancestry that goes back thousands of years and your people lived there for thousands of years and came up out of that land and learned everything about that land that that land could teach your ancestors. And so you have a connection to land as well, just like us. It's just ours is more recent. So and and so recent, right? Like I tell people, so like these these pictures of these mountains behind me, that's on the Fraser River at Lillooet. And the first explorer there was Simon Fraser. And that was only in 1808. That's barely 200 years ago. So our, you know, my grandparents, my great grandparents, grandparents knew those times. It hasn't been that long. So I'll talk about the major differences that are between a indigenous worldview and a colonized worldview and why that has led to so much difficulty and conflict between the people and why it's required so much healing because it was it was basically, it's been trauma, right? For indigenous people in the Americas, since first contact, it has been almost nothing but trauma. <laughs> uh, but we are learning new methods. Uh, thanks to some amazing people, uh, and one in particular who's on the call, actually I can see her face, Shirley Turcott, who, was gifted and, and was learned and, and, and shared uh, a way to see trauma from an indigenous perspective and to connect it back to land. And it's taught so many of us how to, how to get friendlier with it and how not to fear it, but to access that interconnected place to heal it and to access the power and the wisdom and the strength of the ancestors and the land in order to do that. So through the process, we imagine back to a time before contact because we don't understand these new ways. And And, and we, 
had no way of explaining the differences because we never had to explain this to each other. Uh, and we never had to do it in this language either. So when you grow up, when you live in a land for, for so long and you're connected to everything, then you just know, you take it for granted that everything is connected and everyone feels the same way about the land and understands the relationship with the land. And when people arrive who don't know that, you don't understand, you, you, you don't understand how they could not know it. So when they see the land as property, it has no meaning for us. When they see land as being owned or, or to be exploited or to be used, uh, bought, sold, um, we don't understand it. It's to be protected, it's to be improved, it's to be related, right? It's a responsibility. We don't see it as a, as a human right. Human rights, uh, we don't understand either. Um, I've taken the training. I, I'm trained as a human rights facilitator. I can train other people on how to be a human rights facilitator, but I can't do it. Um, because as an indigenous person, that system in that system of human rights, only humans have rights. And how can that be? How can the river not have the right to be the river? How can the mountain not have the right to be the mountain? It's, it doesn't make sense. So we don't under, we don't, we didn't set ourselves up in that way that only humans have rights. We have responsibilities in exchange for the gifts that we receive from Creator. We have a responsibility to, to use, manage, protect, defend in a good way, all that's there. We don't have the right to destroy, sell, exploit, harm. The right doesn't exist. And even if we believed that some creator somewhere did give us the right, well, who would say that? Again, that would be, I guess, some human who would have to say it. <coughs> So I talk about what it means to, to, in a good way. And that means maintaining the balance. So our, everything that we, as I spoke about at the beginning, everything that we have, everything that we are came from the land. And that includes our rules, our laws, our language. Each land imposes its, its, imposes its own set of basic fundamental laws based on that land. So the law of the Arctic is, you know, a little harsh, right? Uh, not a lot of uh, vegetables, not a lot of fruit, uh, not a lot of available resources to survive. It's a difficult life. So, so the laws there are imposed by the land and the laws of the desert impose themselves as you know how you treat water how you treat each other how you you know how you treat food the laws here on the rainforest the temperate rainforest are a lot more forgiving uh, there's food everywhere uh, there's resources are rich there's fresh water there's lots of game there's seafood so each land imposes its own laws. 
and we would say each land brings forth its own language as well. Uh, Hi, Mercedes. Oh, someone's. <laughs> Sorry about that, Norm. I think somebody unmuted themselves. <laughs> That's fine. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and so really our job was to learn those laws, those names for everything, and then also maintain those laws. And, and you may know that we have no written language. Right? So we couldn't write those laws down. We had to know them. And it's probably, and, and I still can't fully imagine what it's like to live a life without, without words, without written word. I've tried to imagine it. Imagine everything that you know, everything that you learned on how to live, you had to learn and memorize perfectly because your life depended on it. So how to hunt, how to preserve food, how to find your way home, how to not eat the right, you know, to eat the right mushrooms, to, to, to not get killed, uh, to all those things you had to learn perfectly and memorize. So when you spoke and when you listened, you had to pay attention. There's a level of awareness that we kind of don't have anymore because we have Google and we have encyclopedias and we have libraries now. But not only did you have to learn it perfectly because your life depended on it, you had to learn it perfectly because you had to teach it to your children and your nieces and nephews. So the level of awareness and communication had to be at a different level. And I think what we're learning now is it didn't have to be perfectly strictly oral because there's a spiritual memory that we could access. And we're learning again how to do that, to ask our ancestors, how did we do that? And those things are coming back. The songs are coming back to people who go into ceremony, they go into the sweat lodge, and a song is given to them in the sweat lodge and they come out and they share that song. And probably one of the, the most popular and well-known songs now is the Women's Warrior Song. And it's drummed and it's sang around the world uh, in honor of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, and that came to one of our Stadtliam elders in, in Mount Curry in the sweat lodge, uh, Martina Pierre had never heard it before, but it, it was given to her in the sweat lodge and she came out and she shared it and, and it was told to her that, it, that that's what it's for. So we, we're beginning to understand again that we can access that wisdom, that knowledge that's ancestral. So it's there. And that's almost a corollary to intergenerational trauma. You may have heard of intergenerational trauma, which is the trauma of, of our ancestors, which gets passed down and which impacts us. Like the trauma of residential school or the trauma of colonization. And, and then it manifests and it causes us some harm um, because it's familiar, but it's not just us. You know, just as much as we have intergenerational trauma of pandemic and epidemic, and so this, this time recently is familiar to us, so too do you. In your family histories, there is epidemic, there is pandemic, there is war, there's famine, there's, there's dislocation, there is colonization in your family history as well. Some of it is from a colonizer perspective, <laughs> but that's no less traumatic. To be a colonizer is just to be on the other side of that coin. 
it's trauma that that's a trauma coin that has two sides so so we all have some intergenerational trauma to to heal from uh, i think we might as well do it together so we've talked about responsibilities that we don't see things from a rights perspective it's it's a relation you know it's a, it's a responsibilities perspective and i talked a bit a little bit about balance so we i work at a community policing center and we speak to police academy and sheriff's academy and i let them know that i cannot call this legal system of laws in canada a justice system hi greg because it was i'm never... doing well how are you Sorry, Norm, we're having some difficulties with this whole muting thing. Um, we will try to stay on top of it if somebody keeps unmuting themselves. <laughs> Sorry about that, Norm. Jump, keep going. <laughs> that's not no real problem. Keeps me humble. <laughs> um, so, so I can't call it a justice system because it was never designed to provide justice for indigenous people, right? We didn't write any of those laws. We all had laws in place a thousand years ago. We just didn't write them down. As soon as someone else showed up, then they saw that we didn't have written laws. They said, oh, what a great opportunity. We can write some laws. Now, the first time this happened must have been thousands of years in some other place. But once one group of humans, or even one human, figures out that he can write down some laws and impose them on other people because they're written, what a fantastic deal that is. If I could write laws and make the rules right now, I would, and they would probably benefit me, right? Uh, just like if we played Monopoly and, and I got to write the rules as we went along, then you're pretty sure that I would win. Um, so that's a that's a that's probably the most effective tool of colonization that there that there is is the ability to give yourself the the right and the power to write the laws, um, because then they will most likely, and sometimes in very very subtle ways and sometimes in explicit ways, benefit you and and your friends and the people who are most like you and that's that's human nature unfortunately um so you know it's often said that almost every law in, in canada and the united states or colonized world are written by old white men uh, so that's who benefits the most from those laws um, right and and that showed up in those laws right so you need or want to commit an injustice, well, the colonized way is first you write the law. You give yourself the power to commit that injustice and the, the right to commit that injustice, the authority, and then you can go ahead and do it because it's the law. And, and, and that's you know where the, the line or the phrase rule of law comes. So you impose the rule of law on some people. And to, me, to, to Indigenous people, that's a catchphrase. If we hear rule of law, well, we know that very soon an injustice is about to be enforced on us <laughs> by the law <laughs> because they just made it legal. That's all. Most injustices were legal when they were committed. So our version of justice is not based on anything like that. It's not based on that because we had no written language. Disagreements, conversations demanded a conversation. Like if we had a disagreement about who's, who's gonna fish here, right? It, at this river, at the Fraser River, because we have our fishing spots. Well, we had to have the conversation neither side could go back and refer to the to the written law and say well it, it's written right here in these words that i get to on thursdays i get to fish it doesn't say that so having an oral tradition meant it, it forced us to have the conversation until we resolved it 
which leads to the other major, I guess, feature of, of indigenous worldview is relationship. We talked about all my relations and how we're related to everything. The relationship is more important than the issue. It's more important than the thing. The relationship is fundamental because we're all related. So, you know, if I look at this vast, diverse array of faces in front of me, <laughs> and, and maybe intellectually you can think that, yes, we probably are somehow very, very distantly related, but it's not distant and it's not abstract to us. We, we share spirit, right? Our spirits are intermingled. They just are. Well, that, that's going to probably lead to the, to the next big topic here of spirituality. We're not religious, right? We're spiritual, which means we know that we have spirit, which, which is beyond just these physical bodies, right? So religion tends to also agree that. Most religions agree that there's more to us than just meat, <laughs> than our bones, that there's a soul, that there's a, there's a spiritual aspect of, of our existence. But it tends to, again, attach a whole bunch of written laws that go along with that. And it usually only ascribes spirit to humans. And in the beginning, it was only certain humans. You know, other humans maybe didn't have spirit. It took a long time for the church, the, the Catholic church or the Pope to recognize that indigenous people had souls. Until that time, until the Pope made that decision, we could be treated as animals and, and murdered as such. Um, so humans are very good <laughs> at setting up the rules in such a way that it benefits them, especially those who are, who are making the rules. And, you, and I don't know why this happened, but it's usually the old men <laughs> who take, seize the, the authority to, to write the rules and interpret the rules. So so our, our, our definition of justice is different. Justice is about healing and balance and harmony, right? Just because we learned it from nature, we learned it from the land, we learned it from the animals, we learned it from everything that was there before us. And it's all, and, and the balance of nature is it's powerful, but it's delicate. And so we learn to live within that balance and to maintain the balance. And it's, and it's balancing a million different things at once. And we understood that. But it is not always easy. Sometimes it, it probably would be easier to impose our will on um, a river. And to, you know, to say, well, we don't like that the river goes up and down every, without our, you know, beyond our control. So I guess once humans had the ability to actually control rivers and lakes and things of that nature, it probably does seem more expedient to do so. We just never got to that point, I guess. Now, the other thing that comes from being relationship oriented is that because we know that we're related to everyone and everything, it means we're never alone. It means we don't understand this concept of individualism. And we don't know where it came from. I talked a little bit about So it seems that the roots of Western philosophy come from, you know, 
some work by Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am, which essentially says that each of us is an individual and each of us is separate from everyone else. Um, I can never see through your eyes and you can never see through mine. I can't know how things taste to you or, or your thoughts or your feelings. And therefore we're separate. Every single person is alone behind those eyes. And we don't understand that. That is a universe where everyone is alone. And to us, that's a terrifying thought. Even just try to imagine for a second to be alone in the universe. Nothing's more terrifying. Instead, we know that we are never alone. Even if there are no other humans on the planet, we know that Grandmother Earth is with us and loves us and holds us and has given us everything. We know that the trees, the mountains, the rivers, they all have spirit, right? And maybe that's difficult for some people. No, but so imagine the water, like the glass of water. You have a glass of water in front of you and, and you think, well, does that water have spirit? Well, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe if you if you believe not, then okay, that water has no spirit. But but what if you drink that glass of water? Now suddenly that water is part of you. Then does that water have spirit? That's you know think of it that way so eventually everything interchanges we're, we're all in transit so we've looked at a few of those differences and then one last one here i want to look at is um well one last thing on justice is so our justice system is based on balance and healing it's not based on sin or crime and punishment. It's not based on sin and penitence. It's based on healing and balance. Harm comes when things are out of balance. Um, so really, the, the task is to heal that harm and to restore the balance, which is, you know, one of the modern definitions of restorative justice. Um, and the other thing is because we're all connected and we're all related, we are each other. So because of that separation of self and other, me and you, us and them, this idea got created that we can benefit at your expense or I can benefit at your expense, right? That I can take your stuff. Therefore I win, you lose, right? We didn't understand that either. There, there is no I, right? We didn't have an I. Um, from a physical body perspective, yes. Uh, but from a spiritual perspective, no. So this idea of accumulation of wealth, um, where I'm from, again, we're interior, uh, Fraser River, Lillooet, we had the potlatch system. And in that system, the only acceptable reason for accumulating and hoarding wealth, yeah, there's only one justification for that, and that is so that you can give it all away, right? If you want to celebrate something and you want to honor someone and you want to say something to the people, then you accumulate as much as you can for a year or two, then you call everyone together, then you make your big announcement, whether it's a wedding or a 
chiefhood or you're standing someone up to honor someone and then you give all this stuff away and and that's what you do and at the end you have nothing um, and that's the only acceptable reason to accumulate wealth in our communities to to accumulate wealth and a whole bunch of stuff and to have a big house full of stuff is shameful and actually insane um what's the point of it we there was no reason there was no point so those are some major differences between indigenous worldview and and the way we understand the universe and the way we relate to it and to each other and that's why we have such trouble adapting to this colonized system that's been imposed on us and we're always in conflict with it and you know i say even to the police officers we speak to well you might think of us as always conflicting with with the law but we were here first we were here fifteen thousand years before your laws ever showed up and and your laws were written to conflict with us uh, because as far as we can see the intent of those laws was not to provide justice for us but those laws were intended and designed to advance and complete colonization from the start and we were the largest barrier to colonization and those laws were built on previous laws which may have been used to colonize your ancestors and they're still working perfectly right because all those old laws are still there and they're still the foundations for the new laws and they've all set precedents on how the law is imposed and maybe before we take a break i'll say and, and probably the group of people that have suffered the most under most of these laws is women because women didn't write these laws it was these under these laws these written laws written down that defined women as property children as property other human beings of different colors as property so these systems of laws are you know powerful powerful and insidious tools of colonization and injustice um, and i think more and more people are, are noticing that maybe especially during this time of crisis when we're all suffering under a, a pandemic and uncertainty and we're looking for answers and we're looking for things that make sense and we're looking for friends that we can talk to these things about and i would say that people ordinary people on the ground is uh, is the, probably the best starting point for for all of this okay so there's a question from uh is it pronounced sean yes uh, about uh, newcomers had their own trauma victims well, and my approach to introduce the indigenous culture, well, kind of this is my approach, <laughs> Zoom meetings right now. Um, and, and I have been doing this with Frog Hollow Neighborhood House uh, with their, uh, because the neighborhood houses actually are, are a major resource for newcomers and immigrants to Canada. And so my way of talking about it is to share the, the commonality of of the experience uh, because colonization has traumatized those people as well um, it's, it's not just us ours just happens to be some of the most recent colonization but human history is full of colonization all the way back right thousands of years different parts of europe colonized each other for a long time before they got here uh, whether it was you know the Romans or the Greeks or the uh, I'm not sure what it is about humans but it's we do it so 
Yeah, and and part of it is is introducing each group of people to their own indigeneity. To understand that you are indigenous to somewhere too. Now, and I don't intend and I don't mean to imply that people have to go back to where they were. I don't think that that is required because really all the lands are connected to earth anyways. If we all recognize earth as our first grandmother, then we can build that relationship. We can understand that relationship. We can live according to that relationship together. As long as we abandon the notion that the earth is just property and that we're separate from each other and that we're not in relationship. If I say to you that, I'm sorry, I, I'm not related to you. I owe you no duty of respect or compassion or, or basic human dignity, then, then I'm signaling that I believe I have the right to treat you badly as a as a as another person as as a woman as as a person of another culture and that's scary that i do not believe that that is the answer the answer is to understand that we are all connected and if we believe that we're all connected we're all related then we cannot treat each other that way but it has to extend beyond just people because we're putting this planet at risk because we're treating this planet. Our grandmother, like she's property, we have carved into her body a great deal. We have, we are drilling into her body and we're extracting the fluids from her body and we're poisoning her blood, we're poisoning her body. And I think she's finally saying, ow. And I think our indigenous young women feel that cry in their bones. That's why they are the ones on the front lines saying, we cannot allow this. Our grandmother is saying, ow, and, and we cannot stand by and let it continue. You know, and that includes Greta Thunberg, you know, from Sweden. Um, you know, uh, Takaya Blaney uh, from Powell River, uh, CM Hamilton, so many. Um, Autumn Peltier. And, and maybe I'll talk about this. And, and the reason I think women are the answer Is, is be, and, and maybe that's why they felt, I don't know why men feel so threatened by women. <laughs> but that's the balance that has to be restored, right? Indigenous communities did not impose men's authority on women. We did not have this gender imbalance. And, and, and again, we understood that there's more than just two genders, but women had place of authority and power and decision making in our communities. If you want to understand how decisions were truly made in India, essentially it was the old women around the fire who talked about what was happening, how things were, what was gonna, and, and smoking their pipes and talking about things and, and making the big decisions for the long-term community and, all, and deciding which young men children were going to get chiefs training, which ones were going to get warrior training, which ones were going to 
making those decisions all the way through, right? I don't, I don't know if you understand, there's the, the, the Iroquois Confederacy, which was a, um, formed the, the, the framework or the model for the United States. Uh, different tribes agreed to be, to maintain peace and the great law of peace, it was called. And in that law, it was the clan mothers who chose the chiefs. And so the clan mothers would decide who was the chief and the chief then would be like a war chief and, and he would have responsibilities. But if he got out of line, then the clan mothers would call that chief before them to the council of the clan mothers and they would warn him. They would say, stop what you're doing. This is not what we want. This is not what the people need. And he would be chastised and he'd be sent away. But then if he did it again, then the clan mothers would bring that chief before them and have him killed. <laughs> now that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's pretty harsh, but, but that was a level of authority that was respected and maintained. Um, and in some ways, it's my belief that because women understand connection, the interconnectedness of all better than men do. And the reason I think that they're able to understand that better is because women give birth. So women know that there can be a life inside them that is part of them. It's of course completely within them. That life is in them. It's, it's, and they carry that life for nine months and then it's not part of them anymore. And now it's separate. And they can hold this separate being and it's, and it's not within them, but it's still connected. Those women can look into the eyes of that child and know that there's a connection. And that connection can never be broken. And so women understand that in their cells. And men don't. So if, if men intellectually take a position that we're separate, that we're alone, that we're individuals, we can justify that and rationalize that in our minds because we haven't had that experience of being, of being completely connected and then separate, but still being connected. You know, that's one way of looking at it. So, so, the experience that we have as, as newcomers, as immigrants, as even as refugees, um, it's very similar to ours. Like you don't leave home and come thousands of miles away just for the fun of it it's usually because there's difficulty and maybe there's injustice uh, and maybe you're fleeing something or maybe you're looking for something, but you know, <laughs> and at the roots of all that is trauma, trauma of our grandparents and our parents and our great grandparents. And we're looking for less trauma for our children and grandchildren and that's, that's the human journey, right? And so we all seek that. And, and I think each of us could also use help. And so, you know, when I started the conversations with Frog Hollow, it was, they were looking, they wanted to, to help Indigenous people because they could see that there was a lot of problems. But at the same time, that community could use some help too. And I think we all need more allies. And I think that we, we all work in the fields that we work in and we all do the things that we do for our families. And, and, we, and we come to these uh, Zoom meetings because it's in our nature to help. Because it's in our nature to fight injustice, 
to try to right the wrongs of this world. And that's what draws us together. And if we, each of us agrees on some of those things, then boy, what's, what's not a, achievable, right? Especially if, if women unite. Uh, there's, a, there's a majority right there. Uh, and, and frankly, I'd rather be on your side than the other side. Because <laughs> uh, to me, the other side has proven the failure of those methods and that way. Now, I'm not saying that it needs to go, it's not a pendulum. Going from all this way to all this way is almost no better. It is about restoring and maintaining the balance, the balance that was supposed to be maintained from the start and that I believe indigenous communities were successful in maintaining. And again, it's not just the balance in humans, it's the balance of humans and everything else too. So respecting that and restoring that balance so that humans are fulfilling their responsibilities in maintaining the balance rather than taking advantage of our gifts in order to create imbalance. So there was also another question about the land acknowledgements, which are everywhere. Uh, everyone's got one in their email. Even I got one in my email. <laughs> I hereby acknowledge we work on the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam and Esquimalt and the Slava Two people. Uh, what meaning or value, if any? is there in that? Well, well, people do it. And I don't know if you've ever heard the saying, what's well, the least you could do? <laughs> literally. <laughs> it's the almost literally the least you could do. <laughs> um, it's a gesture, great. But it is also an opportunity, right? So the question wouldn't be asked if we didn't do it. And so the question invites the discussion. Now we would like more, right? It's unseated means that it was done without permission. It was done without consent. So we're often asked, indigenous people are often asked, how do we reconcile? How do we achieve reconciliation? And probably this talk probably started out there. And I say, I don't think reconciliation is possible. Reconciliation, the normal use of the word reconciliation is, has to do with divorce, uh, right? If, if a couple is going to reconcile, it's usually because they've separated or divorced and they're trying to get back together. And presumably that's because they agree or they hope that there's something to restore, something to rebuild, something that was good, you know, that there was love there at the beginning and the relationship was, and it was worth saving. That never existed for us. We did not have that relationship at the beginning or the middle or the end. So what's to reconcile? Instead, I asked the question, imagine if everyone just arrived today and we were here first and you all just got here today and then we had to have a conversation about, okay, how are we all gonna live here based on the fact that we're, we were here first and you want to stay. And then we would say that, well, we, we've got, we've over 15,000 years, we've learned what works here. We have all these rules in place that, that enable us to survive and, 
and to manage things in, in a good way. And we're willing to teach them to you and show them to you and, and how it works here. And, and we'll go from there. What would that be like? Well, of course, that's you know, the first thing I get back as well. Ha ha ha, that's not possible. And then I'll say, well, says who? So what would that be like? We would teach you all that we know about this land because this land taught it to us. And you could learn how, what this land needs humans here to do. Uh, we, would, we would hear your ideas about what worked in those other lands, you know, maybe for thousands of years too, but these lands are a little bit different. And so not everything from there will work here. Uh, and we would, again, it would be a matter of having the conversation, right? Especially if we couldn't write it down. It would demand that everybody knew. And that's harder when there's a million of us here. <laughs> but, uh, but man, technology can do some amazing things. You know, I'm not anti-technology. I'm, I'm also a nerd. I'm, I'm very, ner very nerdy. <laughs> but I, again, would spend a fair bit of time reminding everybody that it's an ancestor that we share this land. And right, my, if, it, if it's our great grandmother, then she's related to your great grandmother. Now the question is, is there I guess a pathway even to go forward to start having these conversations because these are difficult conversations. It might be easy for you to sit and listen to me talk for an hour or two, but really I'm asking you to look at your foundation principles your beliefs, your values with an open mind and an open heart and say, is this, really fair? Is it really just? Is it really right? So our people comfortable enough to say, well, let's ask ourselves those questions about what is right and wrong, what is fair and just. And if we find that maybe there's a better way, maybe there's an opportunity to create something more equitable, more just, then then let's have the conversation. It's a, it's a difficult ask. It's a giant ask for me to ask you to do that uh, because it's, in some cases, it's, it's a question of faith. It can be a question of, of livelihood. Uh, it's a question of moral principle. Can I continue to do what I've done, right? It's, it's questioning our, our personal motives on, can I do what I've always done for a really, really good paycheck, even if in my heart it doesn't feel right? And you're still here, so <laughs> I'm encouraged. And I think as recently is because of the pandemic that people have realized that there are 
injustices built into the systems that don't treat everybody fairly and that the system is not designed to meet the needs of everybody in a, in a, in a, in a good, healthy way. And that the system is not forgiving to disruption. Uh, if people are without a paycheck for three months, that is a lot of trouble for a lot of people. You know, and, and that means that, you know, when, when you're, when you have no work, you may lose your home and then you may lose, and then you're kind of at the mercy of the system at that point. And we see that downtown at Strathcona Park. And, and then we, we see the attitudes that people have towards people who are homeless that, well, they must have made some bad decisions. They must have chosen that. And, and, and it's hard to change that attitude, right? Because people think that, well, if you wanted to work, you could work. And if you, you wanted to get out, you could get out. But it's not that simple, right? That's, if, if it goes that way, that if people can believe that that was just a decision of yours, then that would also imply that you could make that decision to go down there and do that and live like that. And, and I think most of you would say, well, I would never make that decision. Um, and that's probably true. So neither did they. Their, their, their circumstance. And I will also tell you, I, I've met a lot of the people down there. That's part of the work that we do. We go down there. And once you spend some time with those people and you see and you hear directly the things that they have survived. And you just say, my God, I did not know a human could survive dying that many times and be brought back to life and still carry on. And, and, and because of fentanyl, many of these people have died six, eight, 10, 20 times. And they are still putting one foot in front of each other and getting through their days. And then you, you hear the things that drove them to use drugs in the first place. And you say, there are no tougher humans on this planet. And then we get back to that same graph I drew for you last session on the survivor spirit that these people inherited and continue to demonstrate. And you say, this is a resource of strength and, and will to live that cannot be ignored. Uh, so they've earned the right every day to live. Um, now, can we afford to give them justice? Can we afford to give them freedom? You know, people think that Canada is a free country and that we all have access to justice. But others would say that you get the freedom and justice that you can afford. Uh, and that's a, you know, and that's maybe where what happens when a you know, I, like Canadians look look south a lot and say, "Boy, well, we're glad we're not them." <laughs> but it just may that they're they're just a little further down the road than we are. Canada, we it's a luxury to be born in Canada. I say to people, to be born human on Earth is to be is to be it's got to be the biggest lottery win in the in the universe. 
because look at the things that we have access to. Look at what we get. We get intellect, we get dexterity, we get mobility, we get consciousness, we get, we can all, we get taste, we get, we get to be here and experience all this. And you get a certain amount of time, you get 80 years to, to, to touch, to feel, to love, to, to have laughter, joy, pleasure, um, even heartache, you know, even grief and to love and to lose. And where else, where else in the universe does anyone get that, right? And then like we're still looking for other planets that are compare, right? This is it, this is the paradise planet that we know of. And yet someone convinced us that there's a better place somewhere else after this. I don't know. And that then that's kind of gives us the right to, um, you know, to treat this planet like a garbage dump or, uh, you know, or, or like a, like a rental car. <laughs> you know? um, so this, you won the lottery by born, being born human on earth. You get to experience the weather, the seasons, the tastes, the water, each other. Um, and we, and we spend it wanting more, wanting different. Um, and then somehow someone convinced us that we're all alone, each of us. You know, we hear that the, the fastest growing mental health issue in cities is loneliness. All right, and that's, wow. And for indigenous people, we know we're not alone. We're never alone. We know our people are around us spirit of our ancestors are right here waiting for us to ask for help wanting us to ask for their help and when we do boy they sure come through and and beyond that is the land the land wants to help and has from the start from the beginning, every second of every day, the land has been providing everything to us without asking, without limit, without condition, without interruption. So to be provided all that, and then to be, and then to be born in Canada, <laughs> automatic, top 10% of lifestyles on the planet, right? Canada has so much resources, so much wealth of land and trees and minerals and such a small population. Each Canadian should be able to live like a millionaire. And in some ways we do. Um, but we also forget about the rest of the planet, right? That other 90% who live on one or two dollars a day. And they're probably happier than us, many of them. But instead, we, we, what, do we, what do we do with our time here? <clears throat> so for indigenous people, we know that we had something that was really, really good for 15,000 years. And it worked very, very well for us. It was in balance. We were improving the land. We were healthy. We were strong. And when the new people came, well, they, the diseases that came with them put us in a very, very difficult place. We died. We died and we died and we died. And those who survived were so desperate, had no choice but to say, okay, we'll try your way. We will adopt all your ways. We will, we have no choice. Show us, teach us, 
show us the wisdom of, of all that you bring, your God, your language, your laws, your technology, your weapons, bring it. And we've tried. And now we're here. And we say, this doesn't look like the brochure. <laughs> this does not look like the advertising that you brought. This looks unjust, unfair. It looks like only you win and nobody else. So we're learning how to have these difficult conversations in a way that doesn't cause people to be defensive, right? I, 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 I don't, I, I, I like, I can point out the weaknesses, but if someone gets defensive and they start to defend what is, then, then yeah, they're, they're not gonna listen anymore and the conversation will end. And in fact, that becomes very dangerous uh, because when someone becomes defensive, then they're gonna defend themselves. And that is the one justifiable time in Canadian law when people are allowed to kill uh, in self-defense. So if someone feels like they're defending themselves or they need to defend themselves, then that's when they're most dangerous. So we can't afford to cause anyone to become defensive in any of these conversations. So really it's about building the bridges and the commonalities and convincing people that, well, you have as much to gain as everybody else, right? Freedom, justice, uh, health, balance, um, connection. And I think it's available to all of us. And Indigenous people, well, not all of them are willing to share <laughs> and teach. Uh, some, because we're in our trauma too. And traumatized people, well, we're not, don't always res respond in a healthy way. Yeah, I, I'm proof of that. <laughs> I'm learning though. Um, so largely it ends up being continuing the conversation if we can. And I'm willing. It's having the, the attitude of an open, open mind, open heart, open to ideas. We're not asking for immediate action, but if we can explore areas where we can help each other, then I, I think that we're helpful, right? I think that's why everyone's doing the work that they do. Uh, coming to these events, having these conversations, is you are helping your community, you're helping your family, you're helping your neighbors, you're helping the people you can help. And that's human nature. We haven't all retreated into our corners and bought weapons and are defending our homes from everybody else. We're, we're, we're reaching out and we're saying, how can I help? How can we work together to achieve common goals, common common benefits. And, and, and again, with our work with Frog Hollow, I say, how can our indigenous organizations and communities help you as well? Because it has to be reciprocal. And, and again, that's, that's simply about relationship. And we're all about relationship. Now, because we're about a relationship, it does mean that we can't afford to say, unfortunately, if you voted for Trump, then we can't, be, we can't ever have a relationship. 
we have to maintain the relationship, even if you voted for Trump, <laughs> especially if you voted for Trump, because the relationship is more important because the illusion is that we're not in relationship. That's the lie. That's the illusion. The fact is we are in relationship. We are on this planet together. We are in this universe together. We are related, period. We are connected and we have to learn how to behave that way. So we have to also remember, and, and this is my trauma training coming in, that those people that we disagree with and those people who are behaving in ways that just are unacceptable is that's trauma, you know? And the more we learn about trauma, the more we just say, oh man, all this trauma everywhere, all around, but we're learning the answers. And we know that Man, I've healed from so much trauma in the last five years that now when I see my own trauma and I and I react and I and I maybe I I, I even break down and, and cry sometimes for hours and but now I don't run away from it and I don't avoid it. Now I dig into it and I say, what's underneath that trauma? Where is that coming from? Who am I crying these tears for? And I find out, and I ask in, and I find those answers in all those people. And I feel honored that, you know, that I get to cry those tears for them. And that I help to get carry it. And that, and that I still get to wake up and, and do some more work around it. And then get to work and say, you know what? We all survived that trauma. We survived it. My ancestors survived it. Your ancestors survived it. And the proof they survived it is that you are here. We are here. We are all descended from survivors. And we know that if we, we already survived it, all we got to do now is heal it. And, and we know that it's possible. So, recognizing that it's the trauma and that it's not personal, right? People are responding, reacting to trauma, their own trauma, each other's trauma. And once we see that, then become aware of it, then we can start not reacting, but responding in a loving way. In a way that lets that trauma out. Let's that trauma come out of our body where it's making us sick. Come out of our heart and let it and release it and let it out onto the land and let it go. Now, because each of us is moved to help others. So we, we pick up other people's trauma, right? Our children's trauma, our parents hurt, our partners hurt, and we help them with it. We carry it around. Even as children, we did that for our families. And, and many of us have carried that around our whole lives. But what we're learning now is how to set that down. And if we can teach you how to set that down, how to collect it from people, help them set theirs down, and then, and then just set it all down, we don't have to be that that mousetrap waiting to be triggered. Um, so you know, bit by bit, conversation by conversation, person by person, the more we have these conversations, the more I think that we can understand about ourselves and each other 
and get to a place where yeah, I don't know where it goes from here. I, I know we've talked about starting a podcast and, and groups of conversation, and I don't know if it's Facebook groups, but there's an opportunity here with technology. And we know that we can connect across these distances, even though we can't meet in face to face anymore. But these connections are real because we are connected, period. In some ways, this technology is, is an attempt to recreate what we already had. This knowing, this understanding, this felt sense of the connectedness between all of us. Uh, so I've talked almost to the end here. And I wanna make sure that I do take you, leave you in a good place because I've talked about a lot of trauma. And I wanna get you to a good place before we close. And I promise if you send me some questions, I'll, I'll answer them by email somehow. But I will close with an experiential, okay? You know, I, I, I have some notes here of what I'm supposed to talk about, but I kind of just go with what comes. <laughs> Yeah, if you've hung out with me, you know I can talk about this stuff for hours. So thank you for listening, but let's settle in into your body, <clears throat> into your chair. Okay? Notice your breath. Notice where you are. You can close your eyes if you wish. Notice your feet, maybe on the floor. Notice your hands, maybe in your lap. Notice your shoulders. Notice your neck. Notice them. Draining out a little of that tiredness, tension. Another breath. Now remember that place of land. That place of calm, safety. Let your body return to that place of land. Let your body knows. Your body is glad to be there again. Your body says, oh, I know this place. You can smell it. You can hear it. And this land says, welcome back. I have missed you. I'm so glad you're here. And this land says to you, I have known you for thousands of years. You are my child. And this land surrounds you with its spirit. And your spirit feels the land. Embrace it. Your spirit is held, supported, hugged by the spirit of this land. The 
this land tells you, I have always loved you, and I always will. Never forget this feeling of being loved. because it's always there. Tell your body to remember this feeling, to never forget this feeling, and to come back to this feeling when it needs it. Give thanks for the land. Give thanks to the and for its love. Give thanks for your body. Feel your body full, infused, connected. Feel your feet on the floor. Prepare to come back to the room. Feel your hands and arms where they are. Feel your face and your breath. Stretch your body. Be glad to be human and alive and on earth. Now we get to do whatever we want. <laughs> you get to decide what you want. Wow. That felt good. Um, Well done, Norm. Four minutes left. <laughs> I'm impressed. That was uh, that was a fantastic afternoon. What a great way to spend the time with you and with all of our friends um, and everybody that we miss so much because we don't get to see we don't get to see you in the ways that we're used to. Um, and so to see your faces for the last two hours has been um, therapeutic for me and to to hear and to share with you. Um, so we, I put a note in the chat that we'll make sure that we have the space in the evaluation so that if anybody has questions for you, Norm, they can put them in there. And then maybe we'll even figure out a way to do some sort of uh, podcast or something so that we can bring the answers to those questions back to everybody. Okay. Like that could be kind of fun, hey? I could ask um, Shirley if she wants to say something quickly. Well, I wanted to thank you, Norm. That was a delicious afternoon. <laughs> and I have a great big uh, jar of the sweet grass oil that I made. And do you think your grandmother's group would want that? I'd like to gift that to you for spending two great sessions with you. <laughs> so I'll, we'll connect and I'll get that over to you. That would be, okay. that was a beautifully, a beautiful sitting. And I'm so grateful. Thank you. Shirley is my teacher. <laughs> and um, she mentioned the grandma grandmothers. And I uh, facilitate the circle of grandmothers of the downtown east side. And they have a series of Friday lunch uh, circles on Zoom. If, it, if anyone's interested in, in attending and hearing the wisdom of the grandmothers, uh, they're open. We'll, we'll, we'll put out the uh, link on our Facebook page, the Community Policing Center Facebook page. I'll share it with Nagin and uh, Katie if they want to share it as well on mm -hmm. their Facebook page. Yep, absolutely. Well, I think I know what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to say goodbye to everybody and I'm going to go and I'm going to go and snuggle my babies who I've been hearing downstairs playing. So I'm going to go and give my babies a big snuggle. Um, but thank you everybody for, for your time today, uh, Norm. You're a beautiful, beautiful man, and hearing you speak just is is uh, cleansing for all of us in so many ways. So thank you for for your time today. And with that, I will say good evening, everybody.